Technology at its best, man. That's why we have Travis. So, um, no, what I was what I was about to say when we falsely recorded was uh, I'm excited for this because you are the person that I've been mentoring with lately. You've been coaching me. Um, and, it, and it's funny because I've been telling people it's almost hard for me to describe what you do because two things. Number one, I've never heard anybody call themselves an accountability coach. So when I say that, people are like, <laughs> huh? And so like, I don't use that, but I always preface, but like, I don't like saying the word life coach. Cause I think that, I mean, you have a mentor, you're working on yourself, you're working on your relationship. So like, who are you to call yourself a life coach? And exactly. I like, I can help people with their lives, but I'm not a life coach. Exactly. And it, this irritates me. There's weekend courses now and shit like that, that you can become <laughs> a certified life coach, which is wild. But, um, for the people listening, um, this is Andreas. I'm gonna let him do his own intro, but this is the guy that has been. I mean, you've you've been a lot of things for me. I've, I mean, technically, you were one of the first clients I ever got to like practice mm-hmm. training on mm-hmm. years ago. Um, I thought you gave me a great tip. It wasn't a tip. It wasn't my money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was my boss's money. Um, you, I watched you go through a lot in your life that we'll be able to share today. That was really inspiring for me. Um, I had tons of advice from you over the years. I mean, shit from the age I was really 19 years old when I first started till now um you helped me buy my first home sell my first home buy my second home um (laughs) you've watched me have my first child like it's been pretty crazy like when I actually like reflect at how much you've seen of me um so this is really really cool for me just because of that and because we talk so much and you know so much about me so I'm excited to share you with the people that are listening to this um so for the people listening Tell us who you are. Tell us a brief introduction because we're going to dive into your whole story today. But, like, tell us a little bit more about who you are in a nutshell. Um, well, I mean, who I am. I mean, uh, I'm a father. I'm a husband. Um, I'm, like you said, an accountability coach. And that's that's an interesting way how that came about. Um, over time, I've, I've people have reached out, asked for advice and mentoring and, and how do I do this or – or how can I accomplish this? Um, so over time, it kind of just, in a sense, created itself. Um, the actual growth of La Tribu, which is the group of, of, of my, my accountability uh, group, which translates to the tribe. You say it so much cooler than me. <laughs> I say <it>. La Tribu. <laughs> so La Tribu came organically. I can honestly say that it was organically. And, and I think it was a testament to who I was essentially kind of made to be from the people that had influence in my life. Um, and really feeling that it's an humbling experience to, for have people to reach out at any given time. So the difference between accountability coach and life coach, I'm a hundred percent with you that when people are like, Oh, so you're a life coach. It's like, well, I'm not, well, don't you help people with their lives? It's like, well, yeah, but so does, the bartender that's giving you a tip on something at the bar yeah. and he's not a life coach. Yeah. Um, so to me, the, the accountability coach was the simplest, I guess, way to say it um, to where essentially I'm, I'm just here to make sure you do what you're supposed to do. That's really what it comes down to. Right. And I always say the saying as far as what my definition of an accountability coach is. Um, and it's, you know, that it's not my job to hand you the map. Right. Um, on one part, it's my job to help you find it. But the most important thing is I'm here to make sure you read it. And that resonates with a lot of people. It kind of simplifies it um, to the point where they fully understand. I'm not here to give you every direction in your life. Um, I'm not here to say, do this and don't do that. The, your life runs its own course. I'm here to guide you a lot of experiences that I've gone through, a lot of experiences that I know people have gone through and how they've made it past. So that's my description of an accountability coach, seemingly who I am. How do you explain the value in that to people who maybe don't get it or haven't had a coach? Because I think like I've ran into the, the conversation of, because like w- when people ask me about what I do, it's very easy to explain. Oh yeah, people hire you because you're a coach, you hold them accountable because they want to lose weight or because they want to change their right, body. Right. Whereas like when I tell people what I invest in, I've been investing in some kind of an accountability coach for years now. It's like, so you just pay to get on the phone with somebody and talk to them. I'm like, well, I mean, but it's not really that. And I mean, obviously we do more. We meet once a month. We talk right. twice a week. I text you throughout the week. We do different things, but 
sometimes it's so hard to explain like how much value I get out of a 30 minute conversation with somebody and how that helps me change the things I do in my life. You know what I mean? Like how oh, yeah. do you explain that to people that just- it's, it's honestly, it's difficult. Um, cause I get that too. The, well, so people just pay you so you to talk to them. You say you're not really there to guide them. So what is it you're, you're going through? I, I find the power in that from my own experience where whatever things that I've gone through in my life, I've always had somebody that I can count on to open up to and they will not think negatively or positively of what I'm saying. It's more of, I'm here to listen and I'm also here to make you understand where your actions might lead you pretty much. So in a 30 minute conversation, there's times and you, you can attest to this that we don't really even talk about numbers or did you do your exercises this week or did you do you know your dates with your wife this week and all that it's just more of where are you in life generally and open opening the conversation and that really to me is a testament to my mentors that i can pick up the phone and dive into something that maybe i wasn't even really planning on diving into but because subconsciously and inside I feel comfortable enough to talk about it. Mm. And I think that's the trust and more importantly, the respect that should be between a mentor and a mentee or a client and a coach. Do you have like a, a game plan that you go into the calls with? Cause sometimes I think about this too, when, I mean, I don't now cause it's such shitty weather in here in Seattle, but you know, like I used <laughs> mm-hmm. to like, every time you call, I'd be on a walk. Like, mm-hmm. and I used to remember like stepping outside and thinking like, I have no idea what we're going to talk about right now because I don't have something on my mind necessarily that I'm like, sometimes I come on the phone. I'm like, like, I know exactly what I want to talk to you about. Right. But other times I'm like, man, I feel good. Like, I don't, I don't really necessarily know. And then something else like comes out of that conversation or it ends up being an hour long conversation because like Mm -hmm. get something gets dropped. Do you ever have like a, like a motive, especially like we talk Mondays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. So is there ever like a theme to that? Like when you step on the phone or is it just natural? Honestly, it's natural. And I think that's the true power of, of having the connection with the coach mm. or, or with a mentor. Um, I rely a lot on, and we've had discussions on spirit, sp- like my spiritual life, right, with God. So to me, I do have a routine for myself. And it's always a simple prayer of just open the door. That's really what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. Is just open the door to where if it's 30 minutes, there's value in the 30 minutes. And... You know, to me, over life, I've come to understand, as we've discussed, my passion and my purpose. And it sums up to, I'm here to help and I'm here to serve. I really feel that that's my purpose here on earth. So having that mentality leads me to say that if I have a five-minute conversation with somebody or an hour-long conversation, that they walk away feeling better about themselves or at least wanting to be better. So my routine usually before any coaching call is literally a two minute prayer. And it's just asking God to open the door for communication, connection and result, which is what the whole purpose of it is. Let's, let's like, I have, I think I could probably embark down this path, but before I do, I think we should backtrack cause I'm going to start picking apart the coaching process, <laughs> Okay. but I want to tell the people how you got to that point. So, okay. so before we dive more into the coaching, um, let's talk about how it all started and, and really go as far back as you can. Cause okay. you've had, like, I mean, even just like, it, it always blows. Like I, I learned stuff about you when we just did that. Uh, you came and spoke right. to my team for the coaching development right. thing. And there was even things about your past or your history or like your businesses and the charity stuff. And I'm just like, holy shit. I had no, I, I went home and told Shannon, I was like, you have no idea <laughs> how many like people are affected by the charity. Cause I knew you had like right. a lot of your hands in that, but like thousands of kids mm-hmm. i didn't have no mm-hmm. idea so um and it's always been that way with you like i remember going to like geraldine's for breakfast and i would like learn something new about your past and i just be like <laughs> Fuck, this guy's done everything so um i would love to like kind of pick apart the whole mm-hmm. journey man like so like go back as far as you can if you want to like, even your childhood because i know like that had a big a big influence on that was you it. giving yeah. and stuff like that Yeah. so the foundation for me for giving honestly just came from ordinary days in life growing up with my family uh with my with my with my parents and it was always that, it was kind of like a tug of war that I felt really good about what my parents were doing. And at the same time, it was kind of like, when are they going to stop giving and give us more kind of thing, right? But early on, and, and my, my, my brother and my sister can attest to this, that it was always just, that's just the right thing to do. And 
that's for years, that's just, what's just the right thing to do? But why? I don't know. It's just the right thing to do. That's what I was taught. And then I think when I was, became a teenager and in high school, I started really valuing, because I think it was more of a feeling now. Like now I feel good mm. giving back instead of just it's the right thing. A lot of people do things just because it's the right thing. Yeah. But there's no intention. There's no meaning behind it. And that's why I think they're not, one, they're not consistent. And two, they don't really truly find who they are. Do you think that actually, like, so like one thing I told somebody was that it's uh, selfishly being selfless. And what I meant by that was like, I recognize how good I feel when Mm -hmm. I give. So part of me gives just because I feel good, which sounds selfish Mm because it's for me, but it's also selfless because I'm giving so much. Right. Do you think like recognize that just allows you to just do more, I guess? hundred percent. hundred percent. And I think that's, that was a turning point for me was when I kind of came out from under my parents' shadow because all that time I was giving because they were giving. I mean, it was their money, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't have a job. I didn't, <laughs> you know, yeah. I didn't have a car to drive and go volunteer myself. And um, they didn't have much, right? No. I mean, so you- growing up, growing up, I mean, we had, I always say we didn't have much, but we had it all. Yeah. Right. Like we had it, you know, I never felt like I missed something. I never felt like I needed something. Um, yeah, there was people that had more than us, but that happens every day, right? But as a child, uh, growing up, as a teenager, it was never something that I felt bad about. It was never something that that like I yearned for. Like, oh, I need to have that, like that Nintendo or PlayStation. Like that just wasn't. Because to me, I think early on in life just the daily stuff with my parents kind of showed us that one, we were grateful for what we do have. And the other most important lesson was it can always be worse. So giving as you know, through, through the younger years was like I said, that tug of war to where like, what if we'd stop giving? Then that means that we'd have more yeah. <laughs> and we could build on that. And, but you know, after years, it really came out and resonated that, that we actually learned more, we got way more by giving. Well, I, I even think that you saying that you had enough is more than what people realize. I think you're being kind of humble. Because you told me a story about like, um, I don't even know what it's called when the government sends you like mm-hmm. meals and stuff. And like yeah, yeah, you guys yeah. get your block of cheese for the yep. month and your yep. mom's giving half of it away. Yep. And you're like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that, that was that tug of war. Yeah. Right. Where it's like, well, what if I want more? Yeah. And, well, we don't need more. Mm-hmm. Like we, we have enough. Somebody else needs. And... And those kind of moments now I reflect on, and I'm grateful that I can remember them. Um, but in, in thinking, this was probably about 10 or 12 years ago, and really sitting down and thinking, look, man, like, like, first of all, my family's been through a lot, whether it's been health stuff, or, and we're still here, we're still loving, we still, and we still have enough. And this like, eternal search of wanting more and more and more, I always ask, and I've asked you this, is once you get there, then what, right? So then you're consistently trying to get more without even really knowing what that's for. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people get lost is this, again, they're searching for more and more and more every day. They don't have anything to attach it to. So it's kind of like this lost journey to where you're just like, I want more for what? Now, if you can attach it to something, perfect. I want more because I want to get a bigger house. Perfect. But if you just want more just to want it, then it gets lost in translation. And, and why do you want a bigger house? Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I know even for me, like even with this last house, like mm-hmm. that was a big motivation for me to like make more money so I can afford this mm-hmm. house in a nicer neighborhood. But it wasn't to say I lived in that neighborhood. Right. It was because <clears throat> that neighborhood would be perfect for Blakely to grow up in. Exactly. And so like the motive was easy. Right. You know, and now yep. we'd never want to move. I right. mean, that's a lot. <laughs> we probably will eventually. Um, but I think attaching that why <laughs> is, yeah. is the big purpose. So yeah. as you're a kid, you're already getting introduced to this stuff mm-hmm. at a very, very young age. And, and it's funny cause I think about like my childhood and I'm, and like, we didn't have a crazy amount, but my dad was the president of a company. So he made really good money, but he mm-hmm. was gone all the time because of it. Mm-hmm. So my mom stayed home and raised me. Didn't see dad too much <clears throat> until they split up. And then eventually I became like close to my dad again. Um, and now we're really close, but I remember having like almost like money issues because it was almost like money was evil. It's like, Oh, money tore my parents apart. Like right. money, my dad chose money over me kind of right, thing. Right, right. And I, it was all subconscious. I didn't mm-hmm. know. 
until I started like, actually it was until I forgot my first mentor and he was like, I want you to start journaling. And I was like, journal. What the fuck? <laughs> and sometimes I even feel like on the phone, like you're right. like a journal that talks back to me. Right. Kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, but I think I started picking apart at like my history and my story. Or, like, why do I, why do I have the ceiling of how much I can make? And like, mm-hmm. why do I have the ceiling of how many clients I can take or, or the relationships I can have? And this like kind of this, uh, the big leap talks about all time and I'm trying to think of what it's called. It's a great book, but it's basically self-sabotage. You right. have this like upper limit. Right. Um, and money was one of those things. But um, back to your story, like this, you're young when this is happening. Mm-hmm. So how did that develop into your so, teenage years? Yeah. I know you went through some like kind of troubled times yep. and you got out of that. So, so yeah, I mean, essentially that was, I can a hundred percent say that the constant of that or the consistency of seeing that time and time and time and time and time again, it, it really, like anybody else, right, it shapes who you are, mm-hmm. right? Um, the actions, what you do, at times we were told to do it and we just had to do it because mom and dad said to do it, right? But also I think the accountability, coaching, and the mentorship was seen at an early age for me with my dad, right? So my dad was always the one, even till this day, was, but he was the one that a lot of my family came to for advice, for support for help in anything um and the simple fact of him i i don't think i've ever heard him say no right and there was that again internal struggle where like what are we doing this weekend oh well i gotta go help your aunt with this and i gotta go help your grandma with and it was kind of like eh, like again why are we second fiddle and and there was some resentment for a little bit um but over time it's just that's just who mom and dad are and the power of seeing who they are and who they, you know, kind of raised us to be and how it came back to how people respect them. People are there for them now. And it really is this connection of like, I'm, I've given you, so you're going to help me in the time of need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I leave, I leave home, uh, graduate, leave home. And now it's, on me, right? Because now, like, my parents aren't telling me to do anything. My mom wasn't calling me and don't forget to give. And it was just the norm Mm -hmm. now. So, you know, I attest that to the growing up in that environment. I attest my spirituality to growing up in that environment. Um, And at the church, of course, I mean, the churches are there to give, right? But to me, it was more of that's just who I am. It's not because somebody's telling me. So when I moved out, I really was able to kind of hone in on like what I'm really about for myself. And like I mentioned in the team development that we had, the exercises, I consider myself successful now because I can go back to a very specific moment in my life where I can say that I found my true purpose and my passion. And I know not many people can do that, right? Mm-hmm. Not many people, people go their own entire life not really truly finding who that who, or what that is. But to me, you know, I, I moved out and uh, I was playing uh, semi-pro basketball and that's how this whole conversation of helping kids came about was that was my moment of either kind of put up or shut up, right? So almost like you're talking a big game, what are you going to do about it? So this whole story with the orphanages and, and helping kids and, and, and serving, that was a turning point for me where I have zero people telling me or looking at me to do something right it's like anything like if you see somebody fall on the street and you're the only person there you you can walk right by them and not help them and nobody's going to see right Mm -hmm. but if you do what can that lead to so to me that was a turning moment when I was was playing semi-pro basketball in Mexico and um, just noticing and interacting with kids the team that, that that I played for we did a bunch of community stuff and we'd visit elementary schools and all that and on one of those conversations in one of those camps that we, that we had put together, the conversation came up as far as like being able to bring kids into the camp that didn't have much and didn't, you know, so low income as you call it. Now, I don't know if you've been in Mexico or not, but like low income in Mexico is a whole different, yeah. different world than low income here. Yeah. So for me growing up in the States, it was always, yeah, we visited Mexico. We had a family there and you could see like kind of bits and pieces of it but not to the degree that it like reality is. So that led to me saying, you know what? Like there's gotta be something I can do. And that kind of started the conversation of just giving back locally. Um, 
and growing it to an extent of like how many more can we reach every year, every year, every year, every year. So that kind of took care of my, I guess my 20s, if you want to call it that, as far as ages to where we started something, we started a project there, grew it for a little bit, had the bumps like everybody does. Um, and then like, okay, what can we do somewhere else? And doing stuff here in the States or, I mean, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, so doing stuff in El Paso, uh, doing stuff in Denver, where, is, where I was born, um, and just really trying to affect the community, really. And, and I think there's power in doing stuff where you can actually see the result in front of you as opposed to donating to a certain cause. Now, do it. You know, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not saying one's better than the other. Uh, I'm just saying that for me personally, the experience of seeing my labor, if you want to call it that, or my time that was invested, like actually seeing it grow or, or I mean, as simple as if I donate a dollar and it fed one kid, like I'm seeing that kid being fed right mm -hmm. now. So there, there's true power to that. Um, and expanding on that was more of just Again, finding myself, it was kind of like a periodically thing. It's like I found myself, exactly I knew what I had to do. And then there was no stopping at that point because it was just, how do, we, how do we do more? How do we do more? How do we do more? And coming full circle where conversations with my parents, again, it's, it's this weird way, and, and I, I hope I can be that way for my kids to where there was a lot of unspoken lessons with my parents, right, that now I look back and say, man, they never really said it, but they, like, I have it so clear in my mm -hmm. mind that that's what they were trying to, like, that, that was their intention to teach. So that's my mystery, if you want to call it, for, for my kids is how can I be that dad that shares those type of tips or, or meaningful moments without, I guess, saying it, really. So I want to dive into, like, where the charity is now because I think mm -hmm. you just kind of teased it and it's just at a crazy level. I actually didn't mm -hmm. know you started at such a young age. Um, I'm going to date you. How old are you right now? I'm 41. So you've been doing it for almost 20 years or yep, 20 years? Exactly. 20 years. Yeah. Dope. Yep. Um, okay. So before, so I have a question about like grit in general and then about like how you got into entrepreneurship. But the mm -hmm. grit one is it, it first came up because your dad, like you grew up and your dad was already that way. Right. So to <clears> you, that's just the way to be. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, because your dad went through some hard times to be here and to, mm -hmm. to, raise his family yep. in the States and stuff like that. Do you feel like s experiencing those things? And they're kind of the reason I bring this up is because there's a lot of, and we've talked about this, like wake up warrior. I was a part right, of it for right. a little bit. Um, and I love what they've done and what they've created, but there's so many, like two things. One, they're pretty hardcore. Mm -hmm. And two, there's so many, like, I don't want to say copycats, but I mean, essentially oh, yeah. like people doing similar things. Mm -hmm. And you see all these, like, for lack of better terms, fake ass boot camps where they're just mm -hmm. like throwing guys in the mud and shit like that. And mm -hmm. it's like, what are you really doing? Right. But I do believe to an extent there's also value inside of like pushing yourself to that point. Like I remember even doing like resurrection week where there was like things that like made me really uncomfortable or kind of hurt, but like it provided such a valuable lesson right. that I wouldn't take it back. Like, I don't think you should embarrass people by like right, right, right. to that extent, but <laughs> Do you think there's like a, there was a point in your dad's life and then you experiencing that and seeing that? And I think that kind of goes into the charity thing too, is like, mm -hmm. I would never wish poverty up, upon somebody, but when you see poverty, it makes you grateful and, and be able to like, just be more enthusiastic about creating change in your right. life. Does that right. make sense? Oh yeah. And, and I, and I think, you know, knowing the story, for instance, with my dad's story and, and, it, and it's crazy to bring that up because I just, I just saw him two weeks ago. Uh, we went down to Mexico to visit family and we were coming back and we were just talking and, and we, we were going to fly and it actually worked out that we drove because, you know, I got to spend eight hours essentially interrupt, uh, uninterrupted with, with, with my dad. My family lives in, they're, they're in Chihuahua, Mexico, and we were coming back into Juarez, Mexico, which is a border town with El Paso. And that's where my dad grew up for a lot of his life. So we're coming back into town and he starts sharing these stories that I've never heard. Right. And he's like, oh, yeah, you see that train track? It's like, yeah. He's like, well, you know, I once, you know, like 100 percent transparency, he came over here illegally. Right. And he got caught working at a, a mechanic shop in El Paso. And so what he would do is he would come over every day. So he would go from Juarez, cross over in the morning, work, come back the next day, cross Damn. over, come back. And one of those days he got caught. So he said, so we're driving. And he said, yeah, you see that train track? I was like, yeah. He's like, man, I had to walk that train track one day in the middle of the night. It's like, and this is the outskirts of the city. 
And he, and he shares, he's like, well, they, they did a raid at the mechanic shop. They picked me up and they were shipping us back by bus to a city that was 10 hours, let's just say, to, to be approximate away from the border because they knew that we lived in Juarez. So they were trying to send us to a place where it was going to be difficult for us to get back, right. right? So I guess the bus stopped at some checkpoint where there were military checkpoint or something. So my dad asked to get off, go to the bathroom and just ran, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I'm sitting there and we were actually at that checkpoint and I'm looking to the side and I'm looking at this, just this railroad track. And it's just, I mean, it's into like, it's the desert, right? So it's like, it's going into darkness. And, and I'm trying to think of one, like that's crazy, right? Two, the situation and what you're up against at different times, right? And, and you either, he could have easily just sat on the bus and said, I guess I'll see how I can make it back, yeah. right? Or, or the moment of just acting on it. Now's my chance. Yeah, now it's my chance. So the, the, the funny side of it was, he said, I, he's like, I actually didn't, my intention wasn't to run. My intention was, I'm going to go to the bathroom and then from there figure out what yeah. happens. So I guess he went to the bathroom and we walked out. He peeked over the side of the restroom wall and he saw the train track. And I guess some other guy that was on the bus with him also was waiting in line for the bathroom. And they, I guess they just looked at each other and the guy said something like, I'm going if you're going. <laughs> and then they just booked it. Right. So he said it took him, you know, like four hours, three and a half hours to get back to how to the house and all that. I mean, at least he had somebody to his. walk with. Exactly. So to me, like that's one of the stories. Right. But yeah, you know, I, I think growing up and, and hearing the stories of my uncles and my aunts, my grandpa, right. Sharing stories of my dad and the struggles and, and it just added to kind of like the legend, if you want to call it yeah. that, right. To where, like, oh, yeah, your dad did this, and oh, man, your dad helped us out here, and oh, man, if it wasn't for your dad, and if it wasn't for your dad, and if it, and, and then you start, it just resonates every single time to where I can go back right now and meet somebody at the church that they go to because it's happened, and just like, oh, and he'll introduce me, oh, this is my son, oh, nice to meet you, and then my dad will walk away, and then the first thing out of the mouth is like, man, we really love your dad, like, man, if it wasn't for your dad, like, we wouldn't have done this or we wouldn't have done that. And we can always count on your dad. And I think that helps now to really connect the pieces of my whole life and the upbringing and really truly stay like, that's exactly why I'm, I am who I am. Yeah. Right? And the grit of it, I think it adds to it. And I also believe hundred percent that like, unless you see it firsthand or unless you experience it firsthand, it doesn't have the same effect. Mm -hmm. And even now, right? Like if you're driving down and you see somebody that's homeless and struggling, there's, I want to believe that everybody has it in them to feel like the empathy side of it, right? Like, oh man, like it's cold out. Now, whether you act on it or not, that's up to you. But if we really truly understand our purpose and what we're here for, um, I want to believe, my goal is to believe that everybody has it in them to serve in whether it's with time whether it's with money whether it's with just helping somebody going through a tough time and that's what kind of keeps me going is attaching the story of the struggle my parents went through early on to the struggle that we went through as a family and now paying it forward to whoever might be going through that now i think too like even if you don't see it firsthand if you if you if you have somebody in your life that you absolutely trust who mm -hmm. has because you can take their word for it and it's mm -hmm. just, it, it resonates at a deeper level right. because there's certain things that you've shared with me that I'll never see firsthand, but it still has that effect mm -hmm. on me because, and I, I guess like the whole point to me is just like that grit or that grind or what somebody has gone through, or what you, you have gone through. It just makes everything else seem not that bad. Like, right. it, and it, it becomes easier to change your mindset of like, I have to, to I get to. So like when people say like, oh, just don't say you have to work out. Don't say you have to journal. Like exactly. say you get to, and it's like, okay, that's kind of cheesy, but when it you, is, it is, <laughs> right. but it's so true. And, right. and I think it becomes way easier once you see the other side. Yeah. Or, you know, mm -hmm. people who have, and I even mm -hmm. told you the other day, like, even like with personal development, I'm just like, like, why wouldn't I work on myself? Like, why right. wouldn't I invest right. my time to try to just be a better person or right. realize my faults and work on them and stuff like that? Um, okay. So after that, you, you're in your twenties, you've had all these, uh, revelations and lessons and mm -hmm. all these things mm -hmm. from your upbringing how did entrepreneurship get into this? Because you're, you're playing basketball. Again. I got to imagine like any other athlete, you're going to go pro. That's going to be your career. Right, 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 right. But at some point you shifted and you've 
dude, real estate, I, yeah. charity, restaurants. I think, I think, <laughs> I think for me, actually, again, it goes back to my dad. Yeah. Right. So my dad, my dad worked at this, uh, at a dairy plant there in El Paso for 30 plus years, um, until he retired, but he was always doing stuff on the side. Right. And, and whether it was, I mean, he owned a beer depot at one time and then he's always just, whether he's manufacturing something himself and selling it, or he'll f- get an idea, have somebody else make it and then he'll distribute it. Right. So again, early on, it was just have more to give more. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the main philosophy. And I think if, if I were to sum up my family in that, I think that's what it's all been about. And, and we've, we've all acted a certain way, which is, you know, early on when I first met you kind of like the behind the scenes and very mysterious and without, not on purpose. It's just, that's just who we were brought up to be. We didn't do anything for show. We didn't mm-hmm. do anything like, I mean, we did it cause it was just, that's who we were and that was the right thing to do and just so benefit. Pe- just so people know, like the reason he's saying that mystery is cause like, so Andrea is trained at the, at Vigor, right. um, still does obviously, but, um, he was one of the first people I ever got to experience train and he trained there all the time. And it was always just like, cause you would even train, like we had like group cloud stuff, but you would, you for some reason were able to do your own thing. Right. And, like you yeah. had like this little time and right. like you were work, like one of the only people working with, the boss and like and I was always just like man what the fuck does this guy do (laughs) and like I would have a short conversation with you and there was so much like wisdom and and just like intellectual lessons that were provided and like your conversations with people were always like positive Mm -hmm. and and you came at weird times when right you know so I was always just in my mind like this like what is he doing (laughs) I said like the guy from the Dos Equis commercial right right right. the mysterious man but um (laughs) or the most interesting guy yeah and I think and I think that was that was always my way of of working, you know, essentially just do whatever has to be done, right? No matter if somebody sees it or not. Um, but the bigger picture for me was always just the work's got to get done. Mm-hmm. So the whole mysterious thing and all that came, I mean, without wanting it, that's just how I pretty much carried myself. And, and, and I wouldn't say I was like intentionally like every day, like, okay, I'm going to go do this, but I can't make sure that they don't see me and all that. Um, but your purpose behind what you were doing was for you, not for other people. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, and to me, it was always respecting other people's space too. And, and I think that's what kind of shaped a lot of how I carried myself, whether it was in business or interacting with people it was just almost like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to answer unless I get asked a question. Mm. Or I'm not going to over, I'm not going to share unless somebody wants to know. Um, I, I'm that way, right. I'm the way that like, I'm not going to just, I'm not an open book. I don't expect you to be an open book. Now, if the comfort level is there, I'll share. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where having that intentional conversation with yourself of, if I'm really here to serve and help people, I've got to, that connection has to be there. And it has to be there without a lot of words, right? And really with just the way you carry yourself. So to me, again, going back to connecting to my dad, that's what I saw growing up was my dad was, my dad wasn't out there asking if people needed help. Right. My dad was always willing to help if somebody asked and he would always step in when it was necessary. I guess you can say that. So for me, myself, you know, ending the twenties, um, kind of to backtrack a little bit with the grit side with my mom's story with cancer. Right. So I was a young kid. My mom got diagnosed with, with uh, colon cancer and it was just, for me, I remember it, it was kind of like this dark moment for me cause I didn't, I didn't know I was a, I was a young kid. So I didn't know all, all I knew was people die from cancer. Mm-hmm. That's it. Right. Um, I didn't want to know if there was different levels. It didn't matter. It's just my mom's got cancer. She's not going to be with us. What are we going to do? Um, but seeing her battle it and her positivity and her spirituality with it, where it all, it always came back to God's will. If it's time for me to go, it's time for me to go. And it's like, well, it's not time for you to go, <laughs> right? And how can, how can God be so cruel? And like, well, man, why, why is this mm-hmm. happening to you? Like, you're the most giving person I know. Like, why would God want to take you from helping other people? So my mom's side of the grit combined with my dad's side of the grit is, is really, I think, the power behind who my brother, my sister, and myself are to where we've been through so much. I mean, we touched on it earlier uh, before we got on here as far as my fight with cancer, mm-hmm. right? And 
that for me, it wasn't, it wasn't as scary because we had gone through it with my mom for so long that I kind of knew the ins and outs of it, if you want to get it to that, to, to say it that way. And also I was at the same place that my mom was, whereas, you know, my faith in God is so strong that I truly believe that, you know, everything is in his will. And if it was time for me to go, which it wasn't as severe as my mom, um, but if it was time for me to go, it's sad, but in a crazy way, I'm okay with it. Because again, I feel that I had fulfilled so much of my true purpose that it's, it, I'm good, mm-hmm. right? Now, it's, it's scary to say that. And now I look back and say, man, like that could have happened. What, what would have happened if I would have been gone? Like, man, like this, people would have been affected, people. But in the big scheme of things, my faith is so strong, I can honestly say that, and I'll repeat it over and over again to people that ask, that I'm okay with, I would have been okay if that's just the way that my life would have panned out. So for me, having my mom still with us now, right? I mean, you're talking 30 years now, um, with some side effects of, of, of everything she went through, that's a testament in itself. And it only strengthens my, my faith to know that That happened for a reason. You know, some people got closer to God because of that. Some family members, some family members made up because of that. Um, People were touched across. She's touched many people with her testimony. So to me, it's almost like that was just a chapter in her book of still giving, right? Like it was crazy to me to, to be able to accept the fact that she went through all that suffering and pain, but that was a form of giving overall. That's wild. Right? So... Accepting that was hard at first, but again, I, you know, the faith in God, it just adds up everything for myself and for my family to where we know what the purpose is. And now she's strong. She's healthy. She's still going at it. She's still talking about her experiences and reaching even more people on a daily basis. So the connecting the grit, the early on childhood, to my story, it's a very easy connection, right? And, and a lot of people don't, obviously don't know it. Um, but once they hear it, you can say, <clears throat> that's why, right? And like anything, right? Like if, if, if you're a certain way and then you meet your dad, it's like, well, that's why he's that way. Mm-hmm. Or, or you tell me that your greatest influence was your grandfather, you know, then I meet your grandfather and it's like, okay, that's why. So you can kind of start putting the pieces together, <clears throat> excuse me, of how people are shaped in life by different experiences and relationships that they've had so and that was so y- you were playing basketball in your 20s mm-hmm. mom went through cancer in their 20s in your 20s yeah, well yeah teens and 20s yeah okay um <clears throat> when did you stop playing basketball and when did you start like what was your first business and, so, and, and the purpose behind doing those things because i think like we talked about this and i think it's a cool way for entrepreneurs <clears throat> listening to kind of tie in a purpose behind making mm-hmm. money mm-hmm. is you had the drive of the charity stuff right and I think one of the reasons why, I mean, can, can we share how many businesses you own or partially? I own? mean, just a, in a rough amount, I guess. So the whole business, the whole entrepreneur, the whole investment side of it has always been to me a very clear picture of, am I investing money, time or other resources? Right. So I graduated college. My, and I had this, I had this clear thing in my head of, you know the statistics of going pro, like pro pro, mm-hmm. right? Like NBA pro, which is everybody's basketball gonna, dream. Right? Everybody's gonna do it though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every, this is this is yeah. This is the guy that's gonna make it this year. So to me, I knew I, it's 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 hard for me to explain it, but it was just so real in my head that, and it wasn't for lack of drive or lack of goals or like to me it was just like I know how difficult it is. So if it happens, great. Like, I'm still going to give them my all when I'm playing, but I'm also going to start, like, kind of setting stuff aside mm-hmm. or working on stuff for the what ifs, right? My dad, and my, at a very young age, always taught us, you know, have that safety net. Have those, even if it's a little bit, have a little bit of savings. You never know. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, mm-hmm. all, the, all the sayings. So to me, it was always very clear that, as basketball was giving me more, I was going to start doing more on the side as well. So whether it was investing, whether it was 
help, you know, investing in help running restaurants, whether it was on the real estate side, um, helping buy or helping people invest in real estate, make them money, make myself money. It was almost like a side hustle to a certain extent, if you want to put it that, because that's what my dad did. Mm -hmm. My dad was a, like a hustler, right? He just made it happen. And so the, the transition from playing basketball to, I guess, becoming an entrepreneur, there was this gap where obviously you need to make more money if you want to invest more money yeah. and go on, right? So to me, I took, I took, I actually went into, I was like, okay, well, I got to get, I got to make a plan. Like, what is it? What is my vision? So at the time, I didn't have really a lot of experience when it came to like leadership and running a team, running a company, any of that, right? Because the whole time, I mean, I had leadership skills from being the captain on my basketball team, but right. that's only for a certain amount of time. So I embarked on this thing. I said, okay, look, like I'm going to stop playing. I'm not going to renew a contract. And it was, I was 26. Yeah. Some were like, man, it's too early for you to stop playing. To me, it was just, I saw all the pieces of what the future held, which to me were in the form of older players on my team, right? 34, 35, can't even get out of bed in the morning because their knees hurt so bad. Don't have a lot of money saved up. They don't know what they're going to do next. Mm -hmm. So it was always, I was always very visual and very open to seeing the future, if you want to call it that. So to me, I always said, okay, I can play in these leagues, make a decent amount of money, but then what? Right? So that's where the conversation of, and then what? And then what? And then what came up? So to me, I said, okay, if I want to be a leader, if I want to be an entrepreneur, own a company, a big company someday, then I have to learn certain traits. So one trait for me was, okay, well, without really knowing what my business was going to be, it was, okay, I got to learn leadership. I got to learn how to run a team. Cool. So left work, got a job managing people, right? I mean, left basketball, got a job managing people. And there was first, it was like, okay, I'm going to manage a little bit. So the scale here is to manage more, more. So essentially, it's almost like I'm going to be a branch manager. I'm going to be a regional manager. I'm going to be a national manager. And then I can say, okay, I'm ready to lead people. Mm -hmm. So took a job doing that and learned a lot, right? Learned a lot of personalities. It was different from leading a team to leading, uh, leading a basketball team to leading a team in a business because somebody that's an athlete, and you can probably attest to this, is you always want to be the best. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this, so there's a whole different drive. Yeah. Right. So the competition level is there every day. Now, somebody that's just working a nine to five, man, I'm here just to collect my check. Mm -hmm. Right. And yes, there are people that are looking at climbing the corporate ladder, but there's very few of them. The yeah. other ones are just, I'm making enough. Right. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I clock in at eight, clock out at five. I'll see you tomorrow. So that to me was eye opening because I came from this environment of like everybody's ready to kill it. Right. So now the leadership skills were developed from having, you know, employee A that doesn't really want to come to work. Right. Doesn't really want to do more. So, OK, how can I get him motivated to do more? How can I get him to to want to do more? Really? Right. So that's where that initial leadership, I guess, came from, which led to, OK, like worked there for a couple of years. Now it's time. It's time for me to do my own thing. What am I going to do? And real estate was always a constant. Uh, I learned from when I was a teenager, I had a really close uh, relative that did real estate. And I always saw, you know, I like to say it, the bright lights and the fancy cars. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's like, that's it. That's the gateway. Like, that's what's gonna. But there was also this conflicting side of him that he wasn't a giver. So to me, it was a scary thing. If I fall into that environment, am I going to be that way? Yeah. Right. And it's like, well, I don't. And then there's part of me that's like, well, I can change that. Like, I can, I can be that one guy that actually does both. So left that job, said, okay, you know what? I'm going to open my own business, whatever. So I started on early on with, actually, funny story, with landscape, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to do a landscape company. Why? Because I can find the guys, right? And there's always business in landscape, yeah. right? I mean, that's, you know, my, my grandpa used to always say, there will always be people that need two things. They're lawns mowed and uh, funeral caskets. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, if you want to make money, either one of those two things, you'll make money. 
and oddly enough, my grandpa used to do side jobs doing doing gardening and all that. So so I started that. Um, it's kind of funny too because like my I remember my dad growing up. He used to always say something similar, but it was always about oil. Mm. Everybody always needs oil. So like his whole thing was always like you gotta <laughs> right. get you gotta work with oil gas because they that's what they do. He's right. in, uh, in a lubricant department, okay. so he's always sold oil and right. gas and ran companies like that's that. True. But it's just funny how yeah. like. To it, man, my grandpa did lawn, so he always said that. I'm going to tell my diet. Everybody <laughs> is always going to need to be in shape. <laughs> exactly. And, and it's true, right, to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. So, so I learned, you know, so once I did that, branched out into that, really learned, like, the hard knocks of, like, okay, this is, like, entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Like, this is, like, and, and that was, I think, the first time that it was the realization of, one, it's not easy, right? Two, if you don't work, you don't eat. Yeah. Right? And if you have employees – if you don't work that only. Yeah. And I think that's like, man, that's the big one. That's the big one. Right. Like I can always kind of fend for myself, but if I have somebody else depending on it Mm -hmm. and in conversation with, you know, with, with some of the La Tribu members that are business owners, like that's underlying. It's not really like at the forefront. It's like, like you're thinking every day, like, man, if I don't do this, but in conversation and really bringing out what their like main stress provider is it's that yeah right it's the fact that you have a responsibility because people have they believe in you for one they've stepped out of the norm came to follow you and now what right yeah, i can attest to that i think that's one of the biggest stresses but also drivers mm-hmm. you know and oh, i talked exactly. about that at the yep. meetup yeah yep. so so yeah so we did that and then again f- fell back into the the real estate side and said okay you know what like i think the real estate side was more of it, it, it met two things, which was I'm helping people mm-hmm. and it's going to give me a pretty good return on the money. Yeah. Right. So whether it's brokering deals or whether it's investing or whether I figured, you know what, like this is going to give me the biggest return in a shorter time frame. And again, always looking at why do I need that shorter return and why do I need that, you know, mm-hmm. that or that type of return at least in that time frame. So, yeah, did that. And. Throughout all those moments, even from when I was 21, 22 playing ball till, till just, you know, two, three years ago, there was always that people reaching out moment for me where it was like, man, I need your help. And sometimes I would get off the phone. A friend would call me. He's like, hey, man, simple as like, I'm looking to open a savings account. Like, which way should I go? Should I go here? I? And it's like, I'm not a banker, right? But I accept the responsibility of even if it's like, you know what? I don't know. But I let me see if I can find somebody that does. There's not many things you don't know or know people. Because, <laughs> like, even with this warehouse, dude, like, I right. thought about it one day. I was like, what the fuck would I have done? Because I was like, man, I'm going to need turf. Oh, I got a turf guy. Yeah. Oh, sick. Oh, fuck. I got to paint these walls. I got to paint people. <laughs> I need rubber mats. Go here. I got these people. That, I'm like, what? Like, everything. And here you know we I mean? are. Yeah, and here we are, man. <laughs> everything and I got think, together. And that's a good, like, example of, of, like, purpose behind just doing things because mm-hmm. you don't make money off of any of this stuff. Right. I think like maybe even subconsciously, you know that this is a building that allows me to help more people. Oh, yeah. So if you can affect that help, it's like, it's just that spider web. You know what I mean? Well, it really, it comes in. And I think, you know, we defined it um, a week before I had the, the team development session with you mm-hmm. where, you know, we we're talking about the key word, like, who is it that I want to become? What is it that I want to yeah. do? And it never resonated until I was talking to a good friend that like, I think my life journey is to consistently build a longer table. Mm. Right. And and what does that mean? It's, you know, the longer the table, the more people can sit at it. So in, in, in it, whether it's to eat or to hear or to learn, whatever it is, right, that they get affected in a positive way. So to me, I've I've been able to capture, I guess you could say, not only the giving spirit or not only the selfish being selfish, but more of the I truly want to Im- impact everybody I come into contact with in a positive way. So. Yeah, for you, subconsciously it was, one, first off, it's I'm going to help, help a friend out, right? Mm-hmm. You were like, I just literally don't know where to go. Like, okay. And, yeah, it took time out of my schedule. Like, hey, got to get there. Or even with you, like, they don't have a key. Can you meet them there? You know, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But the long, the long goal here, the long-term goal here is the impact that this place is going to have, right? And even in the house, right? Like, well, you, I need somebody to pay my house. Cool. Like. I'll find somebody for you. And is that really serving a, more people and all that? Probably not, right? But it's serving you. Mm-hmm. And if I can pay that forward to you, then 
subconsciously you'll pay for it to somebody else. And then it just, again, there's a longer table. Yeah. So accepting the fact that my goal of building a longer table isn't necessarily like I'm physically reaching out to all these people, but I'm reaching out to certain people that will reach out to certain people that will reach out to certain people. Right. Do you have like a, uh, almost like a way of regulating when and how often you say yes. Cause there's like, you know, the whole thing about like being a yes right, man, like right. you actually, you shouldn't always say yes to exactly. everything. You have to protect your time. Exactly. Is there like an evaluation in your head of, of that process? Maybe it's like, yes. just like automatic now, but like essentially like if I say yes, does this affect the greater good of what I'm, you know what I right, mean? Right, right, After, right. And if, if the answer is no, it's, it's a no. Right. Well, and I think, I think over time I was that, and you know, there's a good book called the uh, give and take. Mm. right and it and it really kind of clears up the whole like are you a giver or a taker right or you you know some people say they're in between and to me after reading that book and having conversations with people that i respect it really came about to you know there is such a thing as being a doormat right and being a doormat is to me the definition of somebody that says yes all the time Mm -hmm. because you and but there's a contradicting point to that that's like well if you're really there to serve right? Then you take every opportunity to help. Yeah. So I think there is a fine line where I learned over time that there are certain things where it's, it's cause I could have easily been like, man, here's a number call. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Here's five numbers. Work it out. Yeah. Right. I mean, I could honestly done that now to me, it was more of, okay, first off, I knew there was a budget, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, I know if I talk to these people, we can make it happen. Yeah, yeah. If you do, maybe not. So if it takes me put together an hour of my life to make it happen to where you're not going to struggle, it's going to be easier for you, you're going to be in here sooner, mm-hmm. right? And then you can start doing this sooner, then why not? Yeah. So I think in a matter of minutes, that calculation happens in your head of what really is it going to take and what's the outcome that you want of it, right? So yeah, I think there is a, this conversation that you have to have with yourself of, do I really want to get involved in this? Um, and sometimes, you know, like the saying goes, you learn better from your bad experiences that there are times where you're like, like what I got myself into, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? When people are blowing your phone up because you decided to help them get their lawn done or something, I don't know, right? Whatever that, whatever that comes out to be. So that internal conversation with me, again, I can attest to that it's happened in the past based off of experiences, but I truly believe that even if I do lose in something, right, it's a win, right? So I always say, I'd rather be the one to lose as long as somebody else gains. So in this instance, right, like I lost, even if I would have lost five hours of my life trying to gather these guys to come in and knock this out for you, you still won, Yeah. right? So that's a win for me. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way. Yeah. I think like one one thing that like really like stuck out to me as we've gone through working together of like how I kind of shifted my mind is really started attaching myself to my purpose, my why Mm -hmm. and chasing that purpose and like legacy versus income. And Mm -hmm. I think that like kind of marries in with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to tie, so I like, I want to tie all this in. I want to go through the cancer thing real quick. Cause I have a couple questions on it. I've I've actually always wanted to ask you about this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I want to tie it all into the coaching. Mm -hmm. Um, so with everything <clears throat> you've done, actually, hold on, let me, let me stop. Cause I don't want to tighten the coaching first with the, with the cancer. <laughs> it, it's so hard for me to choose. Cause I'm like, okay, like I could probably talk about this shit for like right, six right. hours. So, so with the cancer, um, you went through cancer mm-hmm. during that time, you own many businesses. Mm-hmm. You're uh, a part of these charities. You're helping all these people. You have quite a few responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, what, in your mind, like, cause I even remember seeing you mm-hmm. and like, I've actually, you were the first person that was ever, uh, close to me that ever really went through cancer that mm-hmm. I visually saw. Right. And so you almost like get like this, like, I, uh, like, I think it was when we were going to meet at Geraldine's and I'm just thinking like, what's he going to look like? Right, right, like, right. fuck, am I going to like right. notice right away? Am I going to be shocked? Am right, I going right. to like, you know what I mean? Like, don't like be like, Oh dude, I'm so sorry <laughs> right away. Right, right, right. Probably doesn't want to talk about it. So like, but I looked at you and I was like, besides a beanie, right? Because you, because obviously you, you right, shaved right, your right. head. Like yeah. I was just like, and that's and that's how a lot of it, even with you know, when pictures like pictures were shown and of you know people that weren't around me at the time that I was going through it. It was always this this like okay, like you look good, yeah. Like yes, certain things changed mm-hmm. and certain things physically, 
the weight, obviously, and stuff like that. But I appreciate the fact that people came around after the fact and said, man, like, like you always look better than I thought you were going to look. Yeah. Right. And to me, I, that's again, one of the experiences that I can attest. That's like, that's, I'm proud of that because I think it was, you know, people talk about like these auras or people talk about just how you carry yourself mm -hmm. through difficult times the and energy. all that. And I think that that confirms essentially everything that we discussed, right? As far as if you truly fully understand who you are and what you're meant to do, then even in the difficult times, like you're giving that off, right? So for example, one of the times I remember one of my cousins saw me and he made this joke of like, dude, like, like you actually look leaner. Yeah. Right. Instead of looking like, like not sick or I don't want to say that word, but he's like, man, it looks like you got cut <laughs> like going through this. Right. And I know he was trying to make a joke out of it. Right. But it was again in a, in a weird way of him saying that like, like I was, I was okay with it because it was almost like he didn't feel like he had to worry anymore. About yeah. It, yeah. Right. So to me that consistent battle and it was a battle, man. Like, like I'm not going to say it was all perfect and it was all, you know, cancer. unicorns and rainbows, right? There were the, the dark times. There were the the positive times of seeing how you can positively affect somebody that's sitting next to you getting chemo at the same time um, by conversation, by sharing other experiences. With me, I think the most powerful thing that I shared to them when I was in those rooms was my mom's story, mm -hmm. right? And, and it was funny because as I would get into detail with that, they were actually waiting for me to be like, and then she passed away. Right. Like after yeah. 20 years. Right. So it's like, man, she did this. She lost her colon, her part of her stomach, her small intestine, her large intestine, this. And it's just like, and they were literally like, and they even, there were even times where people were like, man, I'm so sorry for your loss. Like, I'm so sorry. She sounded, she's, or she sounds like she was a great woman. And it's like, she is, she's still in Texas right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think it really is the power of how you say things mm -hmm. and how you carry yourself. And you and I have had countless discussions of, of when it comes to leadership, especially in a business and all that is like, you have to be true to who you are, right? Cause the fakeness is going to end. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you really want, whether it's to motivate people, help people accomplish goals, help keep them accountable, whatever it is that you want to do, like you have to be that first. Right. And the, you know, the saying of you, you can't give what you don't have yeah. is the simplest way of saying that to where, I've been around people to where at the beginning it's like, man, yeah, they're great. They're great. They're great. And all of a sudden it's, oh, what, what was that? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, there it is again. Mm -hmm. And there it is again. And now the pain, the picture you had painted early on is smeared or has melted away because the true person comes out. Unfortunately, growth can change people. Exactly. I think like, and this is not like, uh, I don't say this to impress people, but to impress upon people, I think one of the reasons I have had a success is because I've been really good about never changing that mm -hmm. of like why I do all this has like, it's why this says, remember why right, you started. Right. Like there's never been anything different about mm -hmm. what I do. It's just always the same shit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the bigger thing with that is that I think you've had that pretty clear mm -hmm. and at times you've forgotten it. Mm -hmm. Right. And oh, that's yeah. where like stress comes in. Like, Oh man, like, am I really doing, or should I really take this next step? And, or should I really make this other move or whatever? And I think when people start one, accepting the fact that that's going to happen, and that doesn't mean that your purpose and your passion or your purpose isn't clear. Mm -hmm. It's just that something else is in the way right now. Well, and I think like, as you grow in thing, things have to adapt, things have to grow, things have to speed up, responsibilities come into play. Right. And I think they challenge your purpose, right? Mm -hmm. They test your purpose. And that's when you have those moments. And, and that's part of the reason why. I mean, I can't even believe like when I think about how much money I've spent on like mentoring and shit over mm -hmm. the last three or four years, right. it's fucking insane. Mm -hmm. But just the fact that every time I have those moments or even those periods of time where it's maybe unclear for, even if it's a week or a month, like where I'm like mm -hmm. dancing on that fine line, I have somebody to kind of pull me back constantly. Mm -hmm. Why'd you start this? Why'd and, you start and this? And that's the important, and that's, that's the, the clearest way of, of explaining, I guess the value mm -hmm. of having that person. Yeah. Right. Where it's not really, it's not really for the good times. Yeah. Right. It's really for the, 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 not only the bad times, but the times of, of being vulnerable mm -hmm. and actually being to say, man, you know what? Like, it's not that I'm scared of this, but it's just, I just feel really uneasy about this or being upfront with, man, I'm struggling with this. Yeah. Like I keep having well, trouble with this. Even like, 
um, I shared this with Shannon. I was like, there's been times as a husband that I've felt like I've been disappointed in my own actions and felt alone. Mm -hmm. And then talking to people to be like, Oh no, man, like I've been there. I've done that. Or I've made that mistake or like, Oh yeah. Other members talk to me about this too. And then like, it doesn't make it okay. Right. 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 But it at least makes me feel like, okay, well, a, I'm not alone. B it's, it's like, I can fix this. Like I can work on it. You know what I mean? Not like, Oh, I'm a lost hope. Right. Um, okay. One more thing on the cancer real quick is you mentioned, um, you mentioned like accepting that if it was your time, which, that thought scares me, but right, right, right. but I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, did you just know that it wasn't like? Did you just because people I, talk I about think, like belief in the placebo effect of like talking to yourself through yeah. that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I I think I think early on again, right? That conversation of or the first like you got cancer, right? It's just like okay, right? So to me, the first question was what degree, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And then it was more of okay in a crazy way, how is this going to affect the people around me? Mm. Right. Even if like the, I, I, I didn't start processing the fact that I had cancer until after I was like, man, how am I going to tell my family? How am I going to tell my mom? Mm-hmm. Right. Cause now in a crazy, I'm like, my, is my mom going to feel guilty? Cause I have cancer cause she had cancer. So she's going to feel that I got it because she had it or, you know, kind of like that to where then you take a step back and say, you know what? Like I'm okay with it if this is what it is and really putting into perspective of, okay, this is a part of my journey and how can this journey lead to helping other people? Mm. Right. So the placebo effect came in hard and strong after probably the first few months where it was like, okay, like, man, this is my journey. And I think it was when you start experiencing again, being in the chemo room Mm -hmm. with the person that, might not be here tomorrow. Like, yeah. and they, they know it. <laughs> so now again, putting into perspective of seeing whether it's poverty or people going through difficult struggles or more difficult than you, not that it makes you feel better about your situation, but at least it opens your eyes. It opens your eyes to, I can be there. Mm-hmm. Right. And I share stories, you know, about in, in, in the chemotherapy rooms where, you know, you go at a certain time every so often, and there's usually the same people there because they're going at the same time mm-hmm. too. There's people obviously that are going more than you. And having the conversation of almost like, I was kind of like the, the jokester of the group because I just wanted to liven that place up. And I remember even talking about like, man, can we, can we paint this differently? Like this gray is just, it's just, it's crazy. Can we get different lighting? Because I mean, it's literally like you walk in and just, just the lighting and the feel of it is just like, Phew. and then you still got to go through it. Yeah. So... The, I think the most important thing for me that hit me the most was when it's like, oh, man, where's, where's so-and-so? It's like, oh, they passed away a couple days ago. And it's just like, Phew. so again, if I'm feeling bad about my situation, like, that's worse, yeah. <laughs> right? So the placebo effect is powerful. Uh, and, and more than that, like, the effect of people that you have around you in your support system and the people that you can call and, and be vulnerable with there's there's no amount of money that that can that can pay for that in in the long run because that's where we feed off our from our strength right we get our strength from the people that I can be vulnerable with the people that are going to call me on my you know when I'm messing up and also the people that will not even really have to say anything but you just know they're there right so in a in a crazy way my life has been this one big i say kind of connector to where I think I'm here to connect people, not only to other people, but to their inner beings, mm-hmm. to their, their true self. And not that I have a magic formula or anything, but in conversation, that's what's led to where we're at now, to where Latri was growing. And, you know, people are, I call it, not buying in, but really believing the results over, and moreover than not about the check-in sheet, not about... You know, did you do this? Did you do that? Where are your numbers? But more of just the conversations that are had every time you talk. Yeah. And, and having, that, having that open forum to where people can be open with you, but more importantly, be open with themselves. Yeah. Right. And I think it, one of my biggest wins already this year was when I did the team development here. Right. You know, some of your coaches I never met ever. And for them to be open and vulnerable for somebody that they've never known, knowing that it was getting recorded. Mm-hmm. Know, you know what I mean? Like that to me was another, like almost like a benchmark of 
confirmating, com- like confirming that this is what I should be doing. Yeah. Right. Cause people can connect and helping other people connect with their employees, their spouses, their families is, is the goal. I think like, I mean, co- tying it into the, the coaching now, it just makes sense. Like if you, if you look at your story of seeing struggle as a kid, seeing so much giving as a kid, uh, going through hard times, coming out on the positive side, owning multiple businesses. You even have, and we won't dive into today, but stories of like failed, not necessarily oh, yeah. failed businesses, yeah, yeah. but like situa- situations, right? Right. And, and learning from those as well in situations with, I mean, cancer and fighting for right. your life. And, and, and it's just like, it makes sense as to why you're someone that can do what you do. Um, and, and that kind of leads to a couple questions of mine is like, A, I don't believe in balance, but like, mm-hmm. how do you get to the closest thing of balance? Because I know like for me, like I remember, I, I literally remember driving in the car. We were heading to a car show because Shannon's dad had brought her uncle's car to the car show. He had just passed away. Okay. He brought, fixed up the car, his old car, Camaro, brought it in and we were going to see it at this car show. And, and it's funny, her dad, everything you were saying about your dad reminds me of her dad. Like okay. every time you call him, oh, I'm helping Sue with this or I'm fixing this or like <laughs> right, right. he hung up a bunch of shit here, <laughs> fixed my fridge. Like he does like everything's right. always helping. Um, and uh, but we were on our way and, and I like got in the car and I was like, oh, I just saw an Instagram post from Andres and he's like going to do this like coaching thing. And she was like, oh, and I was like, I think I'm going to do it. She's like, how much is it? I was like, I don't know. But. I'm going to do it. Like, and, and she, she, she was all in cause right. she knows you, but she asked like, what makes you like call to him opposed to other people who are, have been doing this. And I was like, he's one of those people that he's like one of the only people that I've ever said, like, like I want that, mm. but not like that as in, cause I can tell you like that guy's got a business. Like I want right, right. that guy's got a car. I want right, right. that guy's got a relationship with his kid. I want, but never am I like, all of that, right? right? Like, and you're somebody that I can look at. It's like, not only do you have, like, I think having it all is kind of like a fantasy right, right, thing, right. but right. like, y- y- to me, like, and it may be because you're my role model, but like, you're the closest thing to having it all. And, and in a way, it's like, everything's always okay. Mm-hmm. And that's, again, a fantasy. Right. Everything's not always okay. Oh. But I think you're able to like, so one of my biggest issues is, is speaking before I think sometimes. <laughs> Sorry, Shannon. Um, <laughs> but but I think you're one of those people that you, you do a really good job of like slowing down and processing before you act or say or do. So it almost seems as everything's always chill. Everything's mm-hmm. going well. Everything is everything's OK because you always have an answer or a plan. Right. And um, how do you like put the pieces together to do that? Like, I guess like I, I don't even know if you can answer that in one question, but I guess I'm just trying to say, like, have you ever like processed that or been asked the, ba- the balance? I question? have actually just I was on a coaching call leading here and and you know we're talking about like this i always say this mythical balance right Mm -hmm. or like this magical balance that that is to me unattainable because it's i I think it's just something that you obviously we're always striving for um but for myself i think being able to compartmentalize every aspect aspect of my life and being true to one realistic goals and realistic outlook of where i want everything to be in my life and the most important thing being the foundation, right? And to me, the foundation is everything. And I am 100% sure of my foundation now, which has led me to be able to build upon that foundation. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to say I have, I've sat back and been like, man, like I got it all together, or it seems like I got it all together. But I lead with positivity always, right? And the true belief of it can always be worse. And Unfortunately, there's people that have it worse. Mm-hmm. So I do, I have set up a certain way of, like, I can easily flip through pictures of kids at the orphanage. And if, man, if that doesn't get you in a better mood of where you're at, I don't know very much well, <laughs> right? So I, I, I do have these moments of, in which I posted a couple of days about, about, like, who I am, right? And these moments of, because I get that question, like, why does it always look like you're on? It always just, like, nothing phases you, nothing. And, and, and in a crazy way, I think it's, all of the experiences, all of the shaping and really honing in on like, if I were to show, or if I were to not feel like I'm balanced, then I, I, I can't give that. Right. So if my true goal, I'm continuously working, whether it's balanced with my wife, with my kids, with, you know, contacting my parents, with my brother, my sister. And there are times where I sit back and it's like, Oh man, like I haven't talked to my brother in a a few weeks. Like that's not okay. 
And okay, what am I going to do to fix that? Mm-hmm. Right? Put him on the schedule for next week or whatever. And even though he'd probably be like, so now I'm part of his schedule. You can't just call me. Yeah. But it's like, like that's that's my way of making sure that it gets done. Yeah. And that's my way of making sure that I don't go another two weeks without talking to him or my sister. Um, so I think in a, I guess, short answer, if you want to put it, there is no formula for it. It's just always trying to put your best foot forward. And really, if I think if you lead by serving, it'll all come back the same way. Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, and, and, and to me, again, I'll repeat it. My faith in God um, allows me to step out, you know, in, by faith to uncharted territory, uncharted waters. If I'm ever feeling, you know, another question I get is, what do you do when you feel like, like either something's wrong or you're off? And to me, it's I read the Bible and I pray. And it doesn't mean that I study the Bible for hours. I literally can just read a scripture and pray. Or I remember something my mom or my grandma told me and I pray. And that kind of just brings me back to a center or, or, or like a zero point, if you want to call it that, to moving forward. I think what I've noticed in my life and then watching you, it, and I always say like, it, I kind of look at it like a game. Like everybody has their own character. Everybody has right. their own weapon. And like right. you, use, you use the tools how you want to use it to, right. to win the game. Right. So like for me, like I think everybody that I've observed has something, whether they call it like, I know somebody has like a fitness, family, faith, finance. Right, somebody right, has right, like right. body, mind, balance, mm-hmm. body being balanced business. Mm-hmm. Like there's all these different things. But if we really dissect it, it's like, are you working on your body, your health, mm-hmm. your well-being? your, your mind, your emotional well-being, your spirituality, your, your relationship mm-hmm. or relationships, right. and then something in your business or your right. career, or your passion, your journey. Um, so for me, like, like putting myself in alignment with all those things every day is, is really what just keeps me on the same path. It's like, okay, I knocked out everything except something for my relationship. Right. So how can I make sure I do that before I leave the house? Or how can right. I make sure I do that when I get home? And, and just having that constant reminder. Um, and I think that's really what people need to do is just have that reminder. For well, and I, and I think that's why you know, in thinking about how La Tribu came about was one of my mentors saying, hey, like, you're spending a lot of time on the phone with people. Like, you got to make it a business. Mm -hmm. And, like, I know you don't, I know you're not going to feel okay taking people's money and all that, but at the end of the day, like, for somebody to be all in, they have to pay, right? And they have to feel that, like, man, I'm paying for it. I got to do it. And second of all, you can do whatever you want with the money. You can you can hand it out as soon as they give it to you, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is that you have to make it a business. Which some of it you do. Right. And second of all, it goes to like formulating, like to me it was like, but how am I going to get my point across or the goal that I want for La Tribu across to members? Mm-hmm. And that's how like the daily and weekly checklist came about was exactly that, right? To where, okay, if I were to go back through my 41 years of life, what can I say? Because essentially I'm selling what I have, Mm -hmm. right? That's, that's my product. It's who I am. And, and, and that's just the way it is. So how can I put that in a chart? If you're going to put it, so literally started that way. Okay. What are my beliefs? Faith. Okay. So you either got to pray or meditate every day. Mm -hmm. Cool. It doesn't matter what you believe in or who you believe in. You got to do that. Family check, kids check, right? Uh, relationships check, journaling check, like all that. It's like, if I do that, and I, and I think at different points in my life, I don't think I was until, I would say about 10 years ago or eight years ago, I was actually doing it on a consistent basis to where I was checking stuff off. Mm-hmm. But if you were to go back through my life, there was certain times where like faith took over and that just kind of carried me. And then my journaling took over and I can pinpoint different times in my life where I remember exactly how that made me feel by doing those actions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the most important things on the list is the go-giving. Because the true goal of La Tribu is obviously to make you a better person for yourself and for your, but also to be a better human being. And how do we accomplish that? I know the power of giving and how that makes everybody feel. I don't care if you've never given. I don't care if you're against giving. Um, I've had experiences where people are like, oh, like, I don't give because I don't know if it's going to go to the, like, I'm not going to give to the kids in Africa because I don't know if they're actually going to get the money. It's like, well, Go down to your local shelter and give there and or or buy something and go give it to somebody, yeah, right? Yeah. And then they do it and it's like, man, that felt good. Yeah. Exactly. I think they'd be surprised too, because I like wanted to start the charity. Mm-hmm. I ended up on the phone with one of the like the top people at the children yeah. children's hunger fund because they were like so thankful and right. and I was like talking to the fucking guy. And yeah. I was just like, 
whoa, this, and I remember texting, <laughs> I was like, dude, this just got real. Like yeah. now I understand and now I feel, and then I immediately had an idea. I was like, dude, we're going to sell these shirts and I'm going to yep. raise more money. And we raised yep. like over a thousand dollars in a week. Yep. And it was just like, that's crazy. Yep. But, and it's all about the intention, right? Yeah. And I think that's what the checklist comes to be is like, you know, and, and you know, obviously you've been through it, but I always tell people like, well, how much do I have to journal? It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. How long do I have to pray? It doesn't matter. Like, just do it. Mm-hmm. Like, my, my spouse touch. What does that look like? Do I have to write? No. It could be one word. It could be an emoji now. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Honestly. And it's like, man, make it simple. So there's no, there's no amount of what you have to do. You just have to do it and do it consistently. Well, and, and even like, uh, we've talked about this. I talked to Shannon about this uh, one night when we were just sitting there talking. And like, her love language isn't words of affirmation. Mm-hmm. But mine is. So my like appreciation to her really is never a note. When she gets a note, it's actually like my way of reminding myself. It's, right. it's like my gratitude for the day. It's like, I'm going <laughs> to, instead of me writing in my journal, I'm just going to let you see it because right. I feel better. Oh, yeah. And I told her, I was like, it sounds selfish, but I do, I don't do that for you. Like, <laughs> I, do I hope myself. you enjoy it. Right, right. <laughs> I do it for me. Like when I wake up and I like clean the downstairs, I put all the pillows. Cause like, I mean, you know how she is with decor. So like. Right. I'll set the pillows up at the angle she likes and I'll put the blanket where she likes and I'll do the dishes and then I leave. So she wake walk like, that's my note for her. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. oh, and yeah. she feels that more than mm-hmm. a note. Oh, yeah. Um, but it, but it was again, like going back to the coaching, it was being challenged to discover her love language, right. being challenged to challenge her to discover mine. Mm-hmm. And then, and like actually reading it and having some kind of habit tracker. Now I have all these check boxes on my whiteboard because <laughs> right. I, I work better with marking instead oh, yeah. of like typing. So for me, like, I have all those boxes of like, what am I doing these 90 days? Um, so the last question I have on all this is just, and then we touched on this briefly and I'm sure the answer is like, you have many mentors, but what is like, do you have a, a mentor that has more of a relationship like you and I have? And, and what does it look like? Cause like to me, it almost gets to a point where you're like, how does like the ultimate men- mentor even have a mentee? Right. You know what I mean? Right, kind right, of thing. Right, like right, how does right. like that even work? Like, does it change or like, is it the same? It's just levels. It's just, it's just levels. So I've had, again, compartmentalizing everything that we just discussed. Like I have a spiritual mentor, right. Mm-hmm. That I have, that I've, I've known him since I was a teenager. And in a weird way, he kind of shifted my way on thinking about the church. Right. So to me, mentors are, are, because you, you'll have people that you look up to every day, right? And people that mean to you for certain things every day. But to me, the true mentors are the ones that have shifted my way of thinking on certain things. So to me, on the spiritual side, he shifted my way on thinking of what I thought the church was and it should be, right? To where, like, the church to me was the building and you go to church and that's it. Mm-hmm. Where he shifted to, like, no, you're the church. Mm. Wherever you are, that's where church is. So wherever you're, you're at, like whatever you do, whatever, however you act, you're essentially, I mean, you're acting the way the church should act. So then my relationship with God at that point became much stronger because like the responsibility was on me now because I am the church. Mm-hmm. So I have him. And then I have another one that who was actually one of the, how can I say? Uh, he was one of like the assistant deans at the college I went to. And he was more like on the business side. I think like, like, when we, when we consider like coaching in general, it's always going to be hard to explain because mm-hmm. I think that it's so individual. Right. I, I even say this with nutrition coaching. People are like, well, what kind of like, what's your method? What's your, what's your strategy? Like, which I was like, well, what's your problem? Right. Yeah. You know, Cause that's really exactly. what it comes down to. Like yeah. it depends. Like there's so many diets out there. So many strategies. There's so mm-hmm. many ways I can do this, but that's the whole point. It's mm-hmm. unique. It's individual. We, we cater to you. We fix that no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like even going back to like, you've had enough experiences to where damn near everything that right. I've gone through, like you've been able to be like, Oh yeah, I've been that. But at the same time, when you haven't, you have something that's close enough to relate mm-hmm. where you can give advice and strategy. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, and, and I think that that's, that's the dark, that's the hardest part in connecting my style of coaching to other coaching because there is no like scientific format yeah. behind it. Right. Yeah. It's not like, Oh, we'll go to this or I mean with fitness, right? Like or nutrition, like eat this, don't eat that. Um, so I think that's the hardest people, the hardest thing for people to understand or to kind of accept that there is no formula other than just open, be open, be honest, be willing to connect, and it'll all come together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I think we could 
we'll probably, we probably will end up doing another one <laughs> right. since you're local, but, <laughs> right. um, we could talk about this for hours. So let's, let's wrap up with, uh, like the top, I mean, like what are like one, two or three things? Like you could even just leave the people with one thing. There's one thing you want to leave everybody with, um, just as like the biggest lesson of what you're talking about, maybe biggest lesson you've learned from starting La Tribu or anything mm-hmm. like that. Just so there's like one power punch at the end to leave people with. For me, it's just, there's, it can always be worse. I can, I can always, I can always from personal experiences, um, that's the easiest way for me to, when somebody's going through something, that's kind of what I kind of make it say to make them snap out of it. Right. Like, Oh, I'm having a rough day at work. Okay. Well, you know what? And I kind of, I kind of touched on it on the team development day, right? Where it's like, your job is somebody's career job, mm-hmm. right? Your house is somebody's career house. So really just putting into perspective that it can always be worse. And if you put your best foot forward and always have a serving or giving heart, in my experience, again, it's, it comes full circle all the way around. I love it. Yep. Um, where can everybody find you? Um, I know you don't have a ton of stuff about yeah, tribute, which is <laughs> like one of those things where I was almost, I almost said this, I was about to be like, man, if you better be ready for when you start really taking that stuff seriously because it's right. already grown so big and, right. and you haven't done that. So right. I know you're on Instagram with it. Yeah. But. Yeah. So on Instagram at Andres La Tribu, Andres for La Tribu. And then um, you can go to latribucoach.com for the website. Dope. I'll put yeah. those in the show notes, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, thank you for having me, man. Like I said, this is actually my first podcast, like format like this. And I was talking to a friend of mine coming in and it was just like, well, are you nervous? It's like, I'm not nervous. It's just, I'm, it's always been like either live interviews, yeah, right, or like on camera interviews, but like recording it and then like for it to come out at a later date was always kind of a new thing. But I appreciate the the opportunity and and I mean I you know you know what I feel about you and the respect, so yeah. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thanks.